that should be a headline to this too. It's not just the restaurants. It's the sales reps, the, the music industry, the, you know, the, there's, there's a ripple effect that goes way beyond just the restaurant by impacting the restaurant. So maybe that we're targeted that way, but like, I don't want to make it just about the restaurants. I want to make it the people who, whose lifeline depends on it. You know, you, you, you put a drop of water over here. How long does it take for that ripple to hit the, you know, the shore? And so right now it's just a little drop of water in the middle of the lake and then will, it will fan out and it will touch the shore at some point and then everybody will see some small effect from it. My name is Patrick Nasser. I'm a co-owner of the Backyard Hill House in Scranton. We are a neighborhood type atmosphere in a downtown setting. We spent the first five years of our business being a bar only. And then in 2013, we finished our expansion, included a kitchen, and now our full service kitchen as well. So we had done exceedingly well as just a bar and we enjoyed that success. And we, we thought the natural progression of things would be to, to add food. And one thing I've always said to people about the atmosphere here is it's, it lends itself to all all types of people. We have a, a grandmother sitting next to a biker, sitting next to a college student, and it works um, because it's laid back and it's a comfortable atmosphere. That's what we go for. In 2008, I think our, our initial roster was about 17, 18 people. Um, our peak season uh, staff roster, under better circumstances, we run about 50 full and part-time employees to keep a roof over their heads and uh, maintain their livelihood. I would say at least 40 to 50% of them are very dependent on the backyard as their sole source of income. I think our feeling on it was like everyone else is that this is a very serious thing and that it's very necessary for us to close our doors in order to prevent the spread of this virus. The feeling was definitely mutual across anybody I knew that, you know, the right thing to do was to close your doors and, and wait to see if we can stop that spread. When the initial closure happened and they, they were telling us about two weeks, in my mind, I, I had no misconception that it was gonna be only two weeks. I really thought it was gonna be at least a month and figured it could go as long as six weeks. So that was about the length that I felt was manageable, if, if anything, for us to wait to get our doors back open again and, and start moving forward. So once we hit that six week mark, um, our nerves started to go a different direction. So our, among our, uh, uh, the ownership, our discussions had surrounded that. You know, there was no, there was no clear like, hey, we can make it six weeks. I mean, six weeks was devastating for us. We had a hard decision. Uh, just from a public perception standpoint, from a safety standpoint, parade day, everybody will remember, was like right at the precipice of this whole closure. But we knew we had to open, at least at some capacity, in order to get in enough money. And that decision, which I feel comfortable with now, knowing that the pandemic didn't even hit our area hard until weeks later. But what that did for us was allow us to pay, settle our payroll with all of our staff. After that, um, it was <laughs> living out of the leftover food product and you know whatnot from from our refrigerators and yeah, surviving on whatever little things we had in the meantime. So we received um, CARES money, EIDL, um, the PPP. People had mixed feelings about what. Um, you know, getting into these programs because they didn't want to have more debt. They were concerned about that. And we went for anything we could possibly get our hands on because our, our mentality was, you know, we want to survive another day. And at the time we were, we were forecasting or hoping for the forecast of like a full reopening, a relaxation of the, the rules um, by, by the mid to late summer. And if that happened and we went into this winter with the possibility that, you know, we could have been operating under fairly normal pretenses, then we probably would have been stable enough. I think the whole time we've been faced with the reality that this may send us down a hole that we can't get out of. There was an issue we had where our neighbor's wall, they had a section of their wall that came loose like the week of our fifth annual fall festival. So historically one of our third best weekends of the year that closed our business. That 
sent us into a tailspin for years. It was February of 2020, where I was in our back office area talking to my, my brother, discussing our financials. And we kind of patted each other on the back and said, 2020 is gonna be the year that we break free of all that bad debt that we had. And we're gonna look forward to moving <laughs> into the future. And I remember as clear as day because uh, a month later, you know, disaster struck again at a level that I could not have imagined. And certainly from our past experience of being closed from, from that, uh, the wall collapse that had happened in 2013, we knew that we had to battle back from that for seven years. And that was a less than one week closure. The prospect of staying open is not just, can we keep our doors open a little longer? It's how do we pay back and, and climb out of the debt that we've been in, the hole that we've been in for all these many months? I was talking to a friend even just today that I think there was a point where we were in that green phase. We had our capacity limitations. Um, we had added additional revenue sources via uh, some outdoor dining out front. Because of the early reopening period, we did more takeout, which you know shouldn't be assumed from anyone that that just comes naturally. Like your restaurant, you just do takeout. It's it's different for everybody. And you would think a restaurant's a restaurant, but a, a pizza place prime for takeout is not a restaurant that you know is prime for in-house dining. A lot of fresh food prep that we had that just didn't necessarily travel well. So we had to adapt our menus. We had hit a stride where we were hitting numbers that are way off pace, but within a realm of profitability, at least um, enough to keep sustaining that, that type of model. The changes in restrictions, the, the amount of time we've had to adapt, it's... I can't say enough about how, how much that weighs on the business owners, how, how tiring that is for us, that the government, without seeming to have made too much, put too, enough thought into it, at least not understanding enough of what makes each of us tick, to make a sweeping decision that affects us on a massive scale, and, and then seeing the ability of my, my peers, what we've had to do, but also my peers and the creativity that you see from these restaurants and how quickly they adapt. Within an hour of a regulation coming out, you will see posts about new promotions and new ideas. And it's inspiring, but it's exhausting because it's not easy to sweep out and change everything you've been doing and then re restart every program. We've literally been working five times harder to make 40% less. And you do that for 10 months and without the type of income or, um, or any prospect of hope um, or hope of help coming, you know, it starts to wear on you because it was, what's the new regulation? How do we survive this week? How do we decide next week? Hard on us, equally hard on our staff, our team. You know, that, that just goes hand in hand. Everything that we feel in terms of the impact from these decisions, our staff has had to adapt with it. I had a meeting with five or six downtown Scranton restaurant businesses about a week and a half ago. And I was maybe so surprised, maybe somewhat even a little relieved to know that what we're facing right now is not just on us. It's with everybody. They all felt the same. They're all ready to possibly close their tours. Yeah, I think the sentiment rings true with everybody that we've been left out there on a vine. And I think that's to, to whatever extent, even from a click, clickbait standpoint, is that everybody knows that it's, you know, it's unfair. But, you know, it just unfair goes beyond for the people who are in it. If I was to have listened to the Governor Wolf's last press conference, I would have been moved by the fact that maybe our industry does need to close. If I didn't know all the facts that I know about what he's talking about, if I haven't educated myself on the approach that they took, it feels very manufactured. Let's get the doctors up here to say how bad your industry is, and then I'm gonna kind of reinforce it, and then really downplay the things that are impacting them on that high level. And then let me blame it on somebody else, the federal government. You know, that was like the process I'm looking at, you know, and it's, it was like, it was like spoon fed, you know? And if you were John Q. Citizen listening to that, 
you would want to be moved to the fact that we need to do more as a society to stop the spread of this virus. I'm that ignorant person who didn't know. I put myself in another industry, sitting on the couch, listening to that. That makes sense to me, except I'm knee deep in it and I'm paying attention to every detail of that. And it doesn't add up, not at the level they're talking about, not to the, uh, not to the extent that they're impacting a specific industry. It feels like they have a uh, whole domain over us and that as long as they have whole domain, it's easy to make somebody the bad guy in this. It's easy to, to blame that industry for being a big part of that. It's apples and oranges when you see a person, a group of people sitting at a table with their masks off eating food in a restaurant compared to a group of people at a large department store. Everybody kind of makes that comparison. It just becomes a volume thing. <laughs> We've got maybe 100 people in here at one time distance per CDC advised regulations, highly under control, controlled environment, sanitized frequently between each visit, lots of standards. Yeah, I mean, that's, but that's different. But by comparison, thousands of people per hour through a store, thousands of people touching things and grabbing things. I think the apples and oranges kind of come together a little bit in volumes and what becomes more of a risk. I think that's just as much of a risk, if not more. It's extremely stressful. It would be anybody, put anybody in, the, in my shoes or the shoes of these other owners, and you're faced again with the decision of your livelihood over lives, wanting to do the right thing, but being criticized that maybe you're part of the problem and not the solution. That's all any of us, and I can speak for the industry. That's all any of us want to be, is part of, the, part of the solution, because what we want is a healthy society. We want to be people to be safe. We have families. This never should be lost on anybody about how much we care about the people who come in our door, our staff who work here, and society as a whole. We're a community-minded industry. The philanthropy from many of the restaurants in terms of giving donations and charities and helping events, like we're, that's what, that's, that's the core. That's our core. We want to do things the right way. We want to see this virus go away. So we want, but we, if you told every restaurant, hey, you guys are part of the problem. So we want to make you part of the solution. We can support you and ensure that six months from now, a year from now, or whatever, that you can open your doors and, and continue working hard for your business. Then I would do that. I would gladly close my doors tomorrow and, and just wait until that happened. Any one of us would because we don't want to put ourselves at risk any more than anybody else. But I have one way to make money right now, and that is selling food and or drink to our customers. That's how we've always done it. You cannot have a business closed as long as we have and expect that they've got the coffers to, to survive that. Hundreds of thousands of workers, and that number may be hard to fathom, but a lot of people make their living from it. But when you look at a list and see collectively how many could just be gone in a year from now or less, I think maybe that would be the staple on people to understand that there's thousands and thousands of people who are gonna be impacted by this. And that ripple effect will affect more beyond that. Engaging where everybody else is at, they're in the same boat as us and we need the paddles. Like, that's it. And you read the articles from Michelin star chefs who run the finest restaurants in the world and they're experiencing that same pinch. That they're closing their doors. It's not sustainable. What's the restaurant industry gonna look like in a year from now, six months from now? I can't tell you. I can't tell you. Demo it means Demolition Man got it right. It's gonna be the finest restaurant is gonna be Taco Bell. Yeah, it's, cha it's gonna be, you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe a year and a half from now, you know, the back here will also be a Chipotle. <laughs> I don't know. So it's, it's either there's not or there's willful disregard for our needs. I have yet to see prove, prove one way or the other that you're either doing this purposefully against us or, or that you're just not listening enough. 
I, that's where I feel like I'm becoming radicalized. Like I just want to stand on a, a platform, you know. Somebody, somebody, call me a call me a priest, call me a doctor. I'm becoming a radical. Like I, I can't help but have like this visceral feeling towards, you know, some of these decisions that are being made. Nobody wants to read "What Was Me" from from the bar industry, uh, from the restaurant industry. We're the we're the people who help drive happiness you know, in good times and uh, shoulder to cry on and sad. I think that's just the mindset of the people in this industry, that the, the ones who have been in it and successful for, for years and years understand that about their customers and know how, to, know how to please them or at least do everything they can to try. I know for us, it's, it's not figurative. It's literal blood, sweat and tears in this place. I've kind of got blood in this concrete and, and, and tears in the, in, the, in the walls. We built it. Here. We literally built it from the ground up, placing every bottle, every cooler. Um, we have our hands on every single thing that's part of this business. And to watch it just go away is, is the saddest, saddest thing of all, at least for us. Mm-hmm.